The Odyssey of Homer. Book 12. Odysseus is passage by the Sirens, and by Scylla and Charybdis. The sacrilege committed by his men in the Isle for Anatia. The destruction of his ships and men. How he swam on a plank nine days together, and came to Aegidia, where he stayed seven years with Calypso. Now after the ship had left the stream of the river Oceanus, and was come to the wave of the wide sea, and the Isle Eaean, where is the dwelling place of early dawn, and her dancing grounds, and the land of sunrising, upon our coming thither we beached the ship in the sand, and ourselves two stepped ashore on the sea beach. There we fell on sound sleep and awaited the bright dawn. So soon as early dawn shone forth, the rosy fingered, I sent forth my fellows to the house of Circe to fetch the body of the dead Elpener. And speedily we cut billets of wood and sadly we buried him, where the furthest headland runs out into the sea, shedding big tears. But when the dead man was burned and the arms of the dead, we piled a barrow and dragged up there on a pillar, and on the topmost mound we set the shop en or. Now all that task we finished, and our coming from out of hate was not unknown to Circe, but she arrayed herself and speedily drew nigh, and her handmaids with her bare flesh and bread in plenty and dark red wine. And the fair goddess stood in the midst and spake in our ears, saying, Men overbold, who have gone alive into the house of hate, to know death twice, while all men else die once for all. Nay come, eat ye meat and drink wine here all day long, and with the breaking of the day ye shall set sail, and myself I will show you the path and declare each thing, that ye may not suffer pain or hurt through any grievous ill contrivance by sea or on the land. So spake she, and our lordly souls consented thereto. Thus for that time we sat the livelong day, until the going down of the sun, feasting on abundant flesh and on sweet wine. Now when the sun sank and darkness came on, my company laid them to rest by the hawsers of the ship. Then she took me by the hand and led me apart from my dear company, and made me to sit down and laid herself at my feet, and asked all my tale. And I told her all in order duly. Then at the last the Lady Circe spake unto me, saying, Even so, now all these things have an end, do thou then hearken even as I tell thee, and the God himself shall bring it back to thy mind. To the sirens first shalt thou come, who bewitch all men, whosoever shall come to them. Whoso draws nigh them unwittingly and hears the sound of the siren's voice, never doth he see wife or babe stand by him on his return, nor have they joy at his coming, but the sirens enchant him with their clear song, sitting in the meadow, and all about is a great heap of bones of men, corrupt in death, and round the bones the skin is wasting. But do thou drive thy ship past, and knead honey sweet wax, and anoint thou with the ears of thy company, lest any of the rest hear the song. But if thou myself art minded to hear, let them bind thee in the swift ship hand and foot, upright in the mast stead, and from the mast let rope ends be tied, that with delight thou mayest hear the voice of the sirens. And if thou shalt beseech thy company and bid them to loose thee, then let them bind thee with yet more bonds. But when thy friends have driven thy ship past these, I will not tell thee fully which path shall thenceforth be thine, but do thou thyself consider it, and I will speak to thee of either way. On the one side there are beetling rocks, and against them the great wave roars of dark-eyed Amphitrite. These, ye must know, are they the blessed gods call the rocks wandering. By this way even winged things may never pass, nay, not even the cowering doves that bear ambrosia to Father Zeus, but the sheer rock evermore takes away one even of these, and the father sends in another to make up the tale. Thereby no ship of men ever escapes that comes thither, but the planks of ships and the bodies of men confusedly are tossed by the waves of the sea and the storms of ruinous fire. One ship only of all that fare by sea hath passed that way, even Argo, that is in all men's minds, on her voyage from Eats. And even her the wave would lightly have cast there upon the mighty rocks, but here sent her by for love of Jason. On the other part are two rocks, whereof the one reaches with sharp peak to the wide heaven, and a dark cloud encompasses it, this never streams away, and there is no clear air about the peak neither in summer nor in harvest tide. No mortal man may scale it or set foot thereon, not though he had twenty hands and feet. For the rock is smooth, and sheer, as it were polished. And in the midst of the cliff is a dim cave turned to Erebus, towards the place of darkness, whereby ye shall even steer your hollow ship, noble Odysseus. Not with an arrow from a bow might a man in his strength reach from his hollow ship into that deep cave. And therein dwelleth Scylla, yelping terribly. Her voice indeed is no greater than the voice of a newborn whelp, but a dreadful monster is she, nor would any look on her gladly, 
not if it were a god that met her. Verily she hath twelve feet all dangling down, and six necks exceeding long, and on each a hideous head, and therein three rows of teeth set thick and close, full of black death. Up to her middle is she sunk far down in the hollow cave, but forth she holds her heads from the dreadful gulf, and there she fishes, swooping round the rock, for dolphins or sea dogs, or what so great a beast she may anywhere take, whereof the deep-voiced Amphitrite feeds countless flocks. Thereby no sailors boast that they have fled scatheless ever with their ship, for with each head she carries off a man, whom she hath snatched from out the dark proud ship. But that other cliff, Odysseus, thou shalt note, lying lower, hard by the first, thou couldst send an arrow across. And thereon is a great fig tree growing, in fullest leaf, and beneath it mighty Charybdis sucks down black water, for thrice a day she spouts it forth, and thrice a day she sucks it down in terrible wise. Never mayest thou be there when she sucks the water, for none might save thee then from thy bane, not even the earth shaker. But take heed and swiftly drawing nigh to Scylla's rock drive the ship past, since of a truth it is far better to mourn six of thy company in the ship, than all in the self same hour. So spake she, but I answered, and said unto her, Come I pray thee herein, goddess, tell me true, if there be any means whereby I might escape from the deadly Charybdis and avenge me on that other, when she would prey upon my company. So spake I, and that fair goddess answered me, man overbold, lo, now again the deeds of war are in thy mind and the travail thereof. Wilt thou not yield thee even to the deathless gods? As for her, she is no mortal, but an immortal plague, dread, grievous, and fierce, and not to be fought with, and against her there is no defense, flight is the bravest way. For if thou tarry to do on thine armor by the cliff, I fear lest once again she sally forth and catch at thee with so many heads, and seize as many men as before. So drive past with all thy force, and call on Crate, mother of Scylla, which bore her for a bane to mortals. And she will then let her from darting forth thereafter. Then thou shalt come unto the isle Thrinacia, there are the many kine of Aelios and his brave flocks feeding, seven herds of kine and as many goodly flocks of sheep, and fifty in each flock. They have no part in birth or in corruption, and there are goddesses to shepherd them, nymphs with fair tresses, Phethusa and Lampety whom bright Neera bear to Aelios Hyperion. Now when the lady their mother had born and nursed them, she carried them to the Isle Thrinacia to dwell afar, that they should guard their father's flocks and his kind with shambling gait. If thou doest these no hurt, being heedful of thy return, truly ye may even yet reach Ithaca, albeit in evil case. But if thou hurtest them, I foreshow ruin for thy ship and for thy men, and even though thou shouldest thyself escape, late shalt thou return in evil plight with the loss of all thy company. So spake she, and anon came the golden throne dawn. Then the fair goddess took her way up the island. But I departed to my ship and roused my men themselves to mount the vessel and loose the horses. And speedily they went aboard and sat upon the benches, and sitting orderly smote the grey sea water with their oars. And in the wake of our dark proud ship she sent a favoring wind that filled the sails, a kindly escort, even Circe of the braided tresses, a dread goddess of human speech. And straightway we set in order the gear throughout the ship and sat us down, and the wind and the helmsman guided our bark. Then I spake among my company with a heavy heart, friends, forasmuch as it is not well that one or two alone should know of the oracles that Circe, the fair goddess, spake unto me, therefore will I declare them, that with foreknowledge we may die or haply shunning death and destiny escape. First she bade us avoid the sound of the voice of the wondrous sirens, and their field of flowers, and me only she bade listen to their voices. So bind ye me in a hard bond, that I may abide unmoved in my place, upright in the mast stead, and from the mast let rope ends be tied, and if I beseech and bid you to set me free, then do ye straighten me with yet more bonds. Thus I rehearsed these things one and all, and declared them to my company. Meanwhile our good ship quickly came to the island of the Sirens Twain, for a gentle breeze sped her on her way. Then straightway the wind ceased, and lo, there was a windless calm, and some god lulled the waves. Then my company rose up and drew in the ship's sails, and stowed them in the hold of the ship, while they sat at the oars and whitened the water with their polished pine blades. But I with my sharp sword cleft in pieces a great circle of wax, and with my strong hands kneaded it. And soon the wax grew warm, for that my great might constrained it, and the beam of the Lord Aelios, son of Hyperion. And I anointed there with the ears of all my men in their order, and in the ship they bound me hand and foot upright in the mast stead, and from the mast they fastened rope ends and themselves sat down, 
and smote the grey sea water with their oars. But when the ship was within the sound of a man's shout from the land, we fleeing swiftly on our way, the sirens espied the swift ship speeding toward them, and they raised their clear-toned song. Hither, come hither, renowned Odysseus, great glory of the Achaeans, here stay thy bark, that thou mayest listen to the voice of us twain. For none hath ever driven by this way in his black ship, till he hath heard from our lips the voice sweet as the honeycomb, and hath had joy thereof and gone on his way the wiser. For lo, we know all things, all the travel that in wide Troy and the Argives and Trojans bear by the gods' designs, yea, and we know all that shall hereafter be upon the fruitful earth. So spake they uttering a sweet voice, and my heart was fain to listen, and I bade my company unbind me, nodding at them with a frown, but they bent to their oars and rowed on. Then straight up rose Pyramides and Eurylochus and bound me with more cords and straightened me yet the more. Now when we had driven past them, nor heard we any longer the sound of the sirens or their song, forth with my dear company took away the wax wherewith I had anointed their ears and loosed me from my bonds. But so soon as we left that isle, thereafter presently I saw smoke and a great wave, and heard the sea roaring. Then for very fear the oars flew from their hands, and down the stream they all splashed, and the ship was holden there, for my company no longer plied with their hands the tapering oars. But I paced the ship and cheered on my men, as I stood by each one and spake smooth words. Friends, forasmuch as in sorrow we are not all unlearned, truly this is no greater woe that is upon us, than when the Cyclops penned us by main might in his hollow cave, yet even thence we made escape by my manfulness, even by my counsel and my wit, and some day I think that this adventure too we shall remember. Come now, therefore, let us all give ear to do according to my word. Do ye smite the deep surf of the sea with your oars, as ye sit on the benches, if peradventure Zeus may grant us to escape from and shun this death? And as for thee, helmsman, thus I charge thee, and ponder it in thine heart seeing that thou wieldest the helm of the hollow ship. Keep the ship well away from this smoke and from the wave and hug the rocks, lest the ship, ere thou art aware, start from her course to the other side, and so thou hurl us into ruin. So I spake, and quickly they hearkened to my words. But of Scylla I told them nothing more, a bane none might deal with, lest haply my company should cease from rowing for fear, and hide them in the hold. In that same hour I suffered myself to forget the hard behest of Circe, in that she bade me in no wise be armed, but I did on my glorious harness and caught up two long lances in my hands, and went on the decking of the prow, for thence methought that Scylla of the rock would first be seen, who was to bring woe on my company. Yet could I not spy her anywhere, and my eyes waxed weary for gazing all about toward the darkness of the rock. Next we began to sail up the narrow strait lamenting. For on the one hand lay Scylla, and on the other mighty Charybdis in terrible wise sucked down the salt sea water. As often as she belched it forth, like a cauldron on a great fire she would seethe up through all her troubled deeps, and overhead the spray fell on the tops of either cliff. But oft as she gulped down the salt sea water, within she was all plain to see through her troubled deeps, and the rock around roared horribly and beneath the earth was manifest swart with sand, and pale fear gat hold on my men. Toward her, then, we looked fearing destruction, but Scylla meanwhile caught from out my hollow ship six of my company, the hardiest of their hands and the chief in might. And looking into the swift ship to find my men, even then I marked their feet and hands as they were lifted on high, and they cried aloud in their agony, and called me by my name for that last time of all. Even as when as fisher on some headland lets down with a long rod his baits for a snare to the little fishes below, casting into the deep the horn of an ox of the homestead, and as he catches each flings it writhing ashore, so writhing were they borne upward to the cliff. And there she devoured them shrieking in her gates, they stretching forth their hands to me in the dread death struggle. And the most pitiful thing was this that mine eyes have seen of all my travail in searching out the paths of the sea. Now when we had escaped the rocks and dread Charybdis and Scylla, thereafter we soon came to the fair island of the god, where were the goodly kine, broad of brow, and the many brave flocks of Aelios Hyperion. Then while as yet I was in my black ship upon the deep, I heard the lowing of the cattle being stalled and the bleating of the sheep, and on my mind there fell the saying of the blind seer, the Bante Regis, and of Circe of Aia, who charged me very straightly to shun the Isle of Aelios, the gladdener of the world. Then I spake out among my company in sorrow of heart. Hear my words, my men, albeit in evil plight, that I may declare unto you the oracles of Teresias and of Circe of Aia, who very straightly charged me to shun the Isle of Aelios, the gladdener of the world. 
for there she said the most dreadful mischief would befall us. Nay, drive ye then the black ship beyond and past that isle. So spake I, and their heart was broken within them. And Eurylochus straightway answered me sadly, saying, Hardy art thou, Odysseus, of might beyond measure, and thy limbs are never weary, verily thou art fashioned all of iron, that sufferest not thy fellows, foredone with toil and drowsiness, to set foot on shore, where we might presently prepare us a good supper in this sea-girt island. But even as we are thou biddest us fare blindly through the southern night, and from the isle go wandering on the misty deep. And strong winds, the bane of ships, are born of the night. How could a man escape from utter doom, if there chanced to come a sudden blast of the south wind, or of the boisterous west, which mainly wreck ships, beyond the will of the gods, the lords of all? Howbeit for this present let us yield to the black night, and we will make ready our supper abiding by the swift ship, and in the morning we will climb on board, and put out into the broad deep. So spake Eurylochus, and the rest of my company consented thereto. Then at the last I knew that some god was indeed imagining evil, and I uttered my voice and spake unto him winged words. Eurylochus, verily ye put force upon me, being but one among you all. But come, swear me now a mighty oath, one and all, to the intent that if we light on a herd of kine or a great flock of sheep, none in the evil folly of his heart may slay any sheep or ox, but in quiet eat ye the meat which the deathless Circe gave. So I spake, and straightway they swore to refrain as I commanded them. Now after they had sworn and done that oath, we stayed our well-builded ship in the hollow harbour near to a well of sweet water, and my company went forth from out the ship and deftly got ready supper. But when they had put from them the desire of meat and drink, thereafter they fell a-weeping as they thought upon their dear companions whom Scylla had snatched from out the hollow ship and so devoured. And deep sleep came upon them amid their weeping. And when it was the third watch of the night, and the stars had crossed the zenith, Zeus the cloud-gatherer roused against them an angry wind with wondrous tempest, and shrouded in clouds land and sea alike, and from heaven sped down the night. Now when early dawn shone forth, the rosy-fingered, we beached the ship, and dragged it up within a hollow cave, where were the fair dancing grounds of the nymphs and the places of their session. Thereupon I ordered a gathering of my men and spake in their midst, saying, Friends, forasmuch as there is yet meat and drink in the swift ship, let us keep our hands off those kind, lest some evil thing befall us. For these are the kind and the brave flocks of a dread god, even of Aelios, who overseeth all and overheareth all things. So I spake, and their lordly spirit hearkened thereto. Then for a whole month the south wind blew without ceasing, and no other wind arose, save only the east and the south. Now so long as my company still had corn and red wine, they refrained them from the kind, for they were fain of life. But when the corn was now all spent from out the ship, and they went wandering with barbed hooks in quest of game, as needs they must, fishes and fowls, whatsoever might come to their hand, for hunger gnawed at their belly, then at last I departed up the isle, that I might pray to the gods, if perchance some one of them might show me a way of returning. And now when I had avoided my company on my way through the island, I laved my hands where was a shelter from the wind, and prayed to all the gods that hold Olympus. But they shed sweet sleep upon my eyelids. And Eurylochus the while set forth an evil counsel to my company. Hear my words, my friends, though ye be in evil case. Truly every shape of death is hateful to wretched mortals, but to die of hunger and so meet doom is most pitiful of all. Nay come, we will drive off the best of the kind of Aelios and will do sacrifice to the deathless gods who keep wide heaven. And if we may yet reach Ithaca, our own country, forthwith will we rear a rich shrine to Aelios Hyperion, and therein would we set many a choice offering. But if he be somewhat wroth for his cattle with straight horns, and is fain to wreck our ship, and the other gods follow his desire, rather with one gulp at the wave would I cast my life away, than be slowly straightened to death in a desert isle. So spake Eurylochus, and the rest of the company consented thereto. Forthwith they drave off the best of the kind of Aelios that were nigh at hand, for the fair kind of shambling gait and broad of brow were feeding no great way from the dark proud ship. Then they stood around the cattle and prayed to the gods, plucking the fresh leaves from an oak of lofty boughs, for they had no white barley on board the decked ship. Now after they had prayed and cut the throats of the kine and flayed them, they cut out slices of the thighs and wrapped them in the fat, making a double fold, and thereon they laid raw flesh. Yet had they no pure wine to pour over the flaming sacrifices, but they made libation with water and roasted the entrails over the fire. 
Now after the thighs were quite consumed and they had tasted the inner parts, they cut the rest up small and spitted it on spits. In the same hour deep sleep sped from my eyelids and I sallied forth to the swift ship and the sea banks. But on my way as I drew near to the curved ship, the sweet savor of the fat came all about me, and I groaned and spake out before the deathless gods. Father Zeus, and all ye other blessed gods that live forever, verily to my undoing ye have lulled me with a ruthless sleep, and my company abiding behind have imagined a monstrous deed. Then swiftly to Aelios Hyperion came Lampety of the long robes, with the tidings that we had slain his kind. And straight he spake with angry heart amid the immortals. Father Zeus, and all ye other blessed gods that live forever, take vengeance I pray you on the company of Odysseus, son of Laertes, that have insolently slain my cattle, wherein I was wont to be glad as I went toward the starry heaven, and when I again turned earthward from the firmament. And if they pay me not full atonement for the cattle, I will go down to Hades and shine among the dead. And Zeus the cloud gatherer answered him, saying, Aelios, do thou, I say, shine on amidst the deathless gods, and amid mortal men upon the earth, the grain giver. But as for me, I will soon smite their swift ship with my white bolt, and cleave it in pieces in the midst of the wine dark deep. This I heard from Calypso of the fair hair, and she said that she herself had heard it from Hermes the messenger. But when I had come down to the ship and to the sea, I went up to my companions and rebuked them one by one, but we could find no remedy, the cattle were dead and gone. And soon thereafter the gods showed forth signs and wonders to my company. The skins were creeping, and the flesh bellowing upon the spits, both the roast and raw, and there was a sound as the voice of kine. Then for six days my dear company feasted on the best of the kine of Aelios which they had driven off. But when Zeus, son of Cronos, had added the seventh day thereto, thereafter the wind ceased to blow with a rushing storm, and at once we climbed the ship and launched into the broad deep, when we had set up the mast and hoisted the white sails. But now when we left that isle nor any other land appeared, but sky and sea only, even then the son of Cronos stayed a dark cloud above the hollow ship, and beneath it the deep darkened. And the ship ran on her way for no long while, for of a sudden came the shrilling west, with the rushing of a great tempest, and the blast of wind snapped the two forestays of the mast, and the mast fell backward and all the gear dropped into the bilge. And behold, on the hind part of the ship the mast struck the head of the pilot and brake all the bones of his skull together, and like a diver he dropped down from the deck, and his brave spirit left his bones. In that same hour Zeus thundered and cast his bolt upon the ship, and she reeled all over being stricken by the bolt of Zeus, and was filled with sulphur, and lo, my company fell from out the vessel. Like seagulls they were borne round the black ship upon the billows, and the god reft them of returning. But I kept pacing through my ship, till the surge loosened the sides from the keel, and the wave swept her along stripped of her tackling, and break her mast clean off at the keel. Now the backstay fashioned of an oxide had been flung thereon, therewith I lashed together both keel and mast, and sitting thereon I was borne by the ruinous winds. Then verily the west wind ceased to blow with a rushing storm, and swiftly with all the south wind came, bringing sorrow to my soul, that so I might again measure back that space of sea, the way to deadly Charybdis. All the night was I born, but with the rising of the sun I came to the rock of Scylla, and to dread Charybdis. Now she had sucked down her salt sea water, when I was swung up on high to the tall fig tree whereto I clung like a bat, and could find no sure rest for my feet nor place to stand, for the roots spread far below and the branches hung aloft out of reach, long and large, and overshadowed Charybdis. Steadfast I clung till she should spew forth mast and keel again, and late they came to my desire. At the hour when a man rises up from the assembly and goes to supper, one who judges the many quarrels of the young men that seek to him for law, at that same hour those timbers came forth to view from out Charybdis. And I let myself drop down hands and feet, and plunged heavily in the midst of the waters beyond the long timbers, and sitting on these I rode hard with my hands. But the father of gods and of men suffered me no more to behold Scylla, else I should never have escaped from utter doom. Thence for nine days was I born, and on the tenth night the gods brought me nigh to the isle of Ogygia, where dwells Calypso of the braided tresses, an awful goddess of mortal speech, who took me in and entreated me kindly. But why rehearse all this tale? For even yesterday I told it to thee and to thy noble wife in thy house, and it liketh me not twice to tell a plain told tale. Thank you for watching. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back.
If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content.